a presentation of the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. In script, words appear as if being written, Trail of Tears, a drawing of a wooded area, Cherokee Nation, 1828. Then, an actual wooded scene. Two children, a boy and a younger girl, run amid the brown leaves on the ground and the bare trees. How did that stop? Run, it's after us. Come back. Hurry, it's going to get you. The girl stumbles. Hurry. The girl stands and continues running, reaching a field of low yellow grasses. A boy reaches a cabin. The girl's grandfather is on the porch and a woman is weaving a basket at a tree. The boy runs past as the girl steps onto the porch. What is the hurry? He said there was a panther in the woods. No panther is out there. And if he was, all you have to do is growl like a bear, and he will run away. Go ahead, growl. Louder. Panther will run away for sure. Maybe your name should be Growling Bear. She smiles. Did you hurt yourself? It was some small thorns. Let us put some medicine on it. He rubs a balm on the scratches on her arm. Better? She nods. 1828. In the southeast United States, the Cherokee people had settled into a stable life. They lived in cabins, farmed, and spun cotton. They built schools and churches. They embraced many aspects of European life while living by their traditional ways. Two Cherokee men in European dress. At one time, the land of the Cherokee people spanned what is now eight states in the southern Appalachians. A map. But from 1721 to 1819, the Cherokees relinquished much of their territory to the burgeoning United States, reducing the size of the Cherokee nation by over 90%. During the 1700s, the Cherokees endured devastating smallpox epidemics and wars with the colonists. A drawing, a colonist aims a rifle. After the turn of the century, the Cherokee began to rebuild and transform themselves. They would establish a formal government with a police force and a court system. In 1827, the Cherokees wrote a constitution and the next year they held a national election. Unlike any other North American tribe, the Cherokee people created their own written alphabet. Invented by a man named Sequoia, it was so ingenious in its design, Cherokees could learn it quickly. The Cherokee people also published the first Indian newspaper, printed in English and Cherokee. The Cherokees lived prosperous and productive lives. But their neighbors in Georgia craved more land for their expanding population. They viewed the Cherokee Nation, its government, and people as a direct threat. A drawing of the Georgia legislature. Georgia did not have the legal right to move the Cherokees themselves, but that would change in 1828 with the election of Andrew Jackson as President of the United States. Regarding the Cherokees, he said, Established in the midst of a superior race, they must disappear. Months after Jackson was elected, the Georgia legislature passed a series of laws taking away the civil rights of Cherokees within their borders. Cherokees could not testify in court. They could not meet in council. Their government was deemed illegal. The editor of the Cherokee newspaper, Elias Boudinot, expressed their outrage. Writing with a quill pen. Here is the secret. Full license to our oppressors and every avenue of justice closed to us. Yes, this is the bitter cup prepared for us. He looks up. Next, prospectors in a stream. The Cherokee people had little time to react before another troubling incident occurred. Gold had been discovered on Cherokee land. The young girl and her grandfather watch from behind tall stems. What are they doing? They're looking for gold. We need to stay quiet. As they look on, the prospectors grapple with each other. Word spread quickly, and people from all over the country flooded into Cherokee land. If hunger for land or the fear of Cherokee sovereignty 
were not enough to rouse everyday Georgians against the Cherokee Nation, the lust for gold was. Within months, 4,000 white intruders were digging and panning for gold. A column of armed men advanced. Georgia then moved into Cherokee country with their own militia, the Georgia Guard. They arrested Cherokees who dared to mine gold on Cherokee land. A man in handcuffs. Then in 1829, Southern Congressman introduced the Indian Removal Act into Congress. The bill called for the removal of all five Southern tribes the Cherokees, the Choctaws, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles to territories west of the Mississippi. Citizen groups from all over the United States sent hundreds of petitions to Congress condemning the bill as immoral and destructive. Night at the cabin, the girl to the porch. What is wrong? Are soldiers really coming? Who told you that? Some boys said that soldiers were going to take us away. They cannot do that. Do not worry. In May of 1830, the Indian Removal Act passed in the House by only five votes. Days later, President Jackson signed it into law. The bill stated that the United States would not violate any prior treaty of any tribe. Chief John Ross and Cherokee leaders took steps to uphold their guaranteed rights. The Cherokee would now fight removal by taking their case to the Supreme Court of the United States. It was a landmark case that was to define Indian sovereignty for centuries to come. Worcester versus the state of Georgia. In March of 1832, Chief Justice John Marshall delivered the majority opinion. The Cherokee Nation is a distinct community, occupying its own territories with boundaries accurately described in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. And which the citizens of Georgia have not the right to enter. The decision was unequivocal. Georgia had no jurisdiction over the land or the government of the Cherokee Nation. But in Washington, Andrew Jackson ignored the Supreme Court's decision and continued to advocate removal. Jackson had told a Georgia congressman, Build a fire under them. When it gets hot enough, they'll move. Seven months after the Supreme Court ruled that Cherokees were clear owners of their land, Georgia held a lottery. The prize? Cherokee land. Thousands signed up. Men jostled to deposit their entries. In Cherokee country, lucky lottery winners were soon collecting their winnings and moving Cherokees out of their homes. If Cherokees did not go voluntarily, the Georgia militia used force. Men with rifles break into a Cherokee cabin. The girl cries in her mother's arms. Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Many Cherokee families found themselves homeless in their own country. A Cherokee dish splinters. Eager to move the Cherokees out, Georgia citizens intensified their harassment. Cherokee leaders sent a letter to the federal government pleading for protection. The lowest classes of white people are flogging the Cherokees with cowhides, hickories, and clubs. We are not safe in our house. Cherokees faced a crisis that pushed them to a breaking point. Some Cherokee leaders saw their nation crumbling under the oppressive laws of Georgia and in a desperate effort to get the best deal possible, negotiated a removal treaty. A Cherokee elder signs a document. At New Echota in December of 1835, this small group of Cherokees signed a treaty. In their eyes, they did it to save their nation. But with 90% of Cherokees strongly opposed to removal, they did it in violation of Cherokee Nation law. Spring, 1836. When the new Echota Treaty was sent to the Senate for ratification, the Cherokee people took action. A petition was signed by almost 90% of the Cherokee people. Hundreds of pages were sewn together. In a cabin, Cherokee women and girls sew pages. The grandfather approaches his granddaughter. My little growling bear, what are you doing? Grandpa, this is a petition. Almost everyone's name is here. A petition? Against the treaty. 
You taught me. If we growl loud enough, I remember. I will help you with this. The petition was taken to Congress by Cherokee Chief John Ross. Next, the elderly man and his granddaughter are alone. Those papers we wrote three months ago, they did not pass them. They denied us. Really? The petitions were not honored. I guess we were not that important to them. The Cherokee Nation had won their case in the Supreme Court. They had shown the federal government that the majority of their people did not want to move. But it was not enough. The Senate ratified the new Echota Treaty. Now the Cherokees would be forced to leave. Two years later, in May of 1838, 6,000 federal and state militia troops entered Cherokee country. The elderly man, frowning, gazes out a window. Slowly, he brings a lit candle to where his granddaughter is sleeping. He sits and stares at her. May 26, 1838. On the 26th of May, the roundup began. A Cherokee man pounds at a horseshoe, then looks up. Armed men stand nearby. A soldier approaches two women carrying a basket. Soldiers on horses come up from behind. As soldiers look on, Cherokee people file out of a cabin carrying belongings. The girl and her grandfather emerge. She rests her head on his shoulder. Don't cry. It is going to turn out fine. Soldiers captured men, women, and children and marched them from their homes. Cherokees were held at nearby forts and then forced into large prison camps near river docks. Within weeks, 16,000 Cherokees had been taken captive. Surrounded by other Cherokee, the girl holds her grandfather's arm. The two pause as they approach many small tents. An aerial view of the camp. Lieutenant John Phelps assisted in the roundup. I could not but think that some fearful retribution would come upon us. The scene seemed to me like a distempered dream or something worthy of the dark ages than the present reality. Cherokees were to be transported west on barges, but after two detachments had left, drought rendered the river level too low. On the third detachment, soldiers marched over a thousand Cherokees 200 miles downstream to waiting barges. It was hot. Before the detachment reached the west, 146 Cherokees had died. A blazing sun hangs in the sky as Cherokees slowly walk. At the prison camps, the heat and the drought postponed the march. At Fort Cass and Ross's landing in Tennessee, the camps grew to hold as many as 4,000 Cherokees each. Cherokees had no access to their medicine or traditional food. Diseases broke out. The Cherokee missionary, Daniel Buttrick, visited the camps and offered assistance. Half the infants, six months or a year, and all the aged over 60 had been killed directly, and one-fourth of the remainder. There seems to be no place, nor means, nor time for the recovery of any who are now sick. A woman holds a small bundle and wails as Buttrick looks on. A crescent moon glows in the night sky.
determined Cherokees refused to surrender their lives, their nation, and their spirit to the impending doom. At the Fort Cass prison camp, the Cherokee Council met. They passed a resolution affirming their nation. The inherent sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation, together with the Constitution, are hereby in full force. Chief John Ross then made a daring request to General Winfield Scott. He asked that the Cherokees be allowed to manage their own removal. Scott agreed. In late summer, the first of 13 detachments departed the prison camps under the management of the Cherokee Nation. The last detachment left in December. Wagons carried the sick and elderly. The weather turned bitter cold. It was to be the harshest winter in years. Bundled only in thin clothing and blankets, the Cherokee march in line through a wooded area. The girl and her grandfather hold hands. The old man bends over. Others reach out to him. They sit him down with his back against a tree. He closes his eyes tightly and winces. His granddaughter turns away. Nearby, two women grieve over a body. Cherokee again begin walking. The trail wound along dusty roads, over hills, through the bitter cold of winter and discouraging relentless rain and wind, across Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, and Arkansas. A Cherokee adult carries a small child. In March of 1839, the last detachment arrived in the new territory. Although the march was over, the hardships continued. Setting up life in a strange land took its toll and many more Cherokees died during the first year. Most had marched over 800 miles. These routes, one by water, carried 12 to 13,000 Cherokees. A map is shown. Conservative estimates indicate that at least 2,000 Cherokees died as a result of removal. A small funeral. Yet, if their culture was to survive, they had no choice but to start again. So in 1838, the Cherokee people began the slow process of reconstructing their entire society. The grandfather and girl embrace. He smiles. For many other Indian tribes, the Trail of Tears reflects their story. An estimated 70,000 Indians, including many other tribes all over the United States, were forced from their homelands. Each endured devastating hardships. To ensure that this tragedy and the events along this trail are not forgotten, the United States Congress in 1987 passed a bill to establish the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail. Park Service signage. The National Park Service administers the protection, interpretation, and preservation of the trail. With several thousand miles of land and water routes, visitors can learn more about the Trail of Tears at a wide variety of sites. Places like Blythe Ferry, Tennessee. From August to November 1838, more than 9,000 Cherokees and Creeks paid to cross the Tennessee River on a small ferry here. Village Creek, Arkansas, where thousands of weary feet cut a deep trail through the earth. Pea Ridge, Arkansas, near the end of a long and devastating journey, exhausted Cherokees gathered strength to cover the final miles. These are just a few sites that have been protected as a reminder of the grim realities 
of the Trail of Tears. The elderly man chats animatedly with his granddaughter. Over the years, the Cherokee Nation and its people have rebuilt and transformed. Today, they are one of the largest Indian populations in the United States. The Cherokee Nation has regained many of its sovereign rights and is one of the largest employers in eastern Oklahoma. A modern classroom. Throughout it all, Cherokees have remained connected to their traditional values. Here, one will not hear the anguished voice of a forgotten and broken people. Instead, one might hear the pride of a people who faced overwhelming adversity and persevered. Cherokee children romp. In the mountains of North Carolina is the eastern band of Cherokee Indians, comprised in part of descendants of those Cherokees who escaped the Roundup and hid in the mountains. Today, as with their western relatives, they have flourished while retaining their culture. A woman beating. The story of the Trail of Tears reveals one of the darkest chapters of American history. It uncovers events of devastating oppression, injustice, and cruelty. But this story also brings to light acts of humanity and courage. It reveals an enduring spirit of people that transcends race. And today, if we explore this story and keep it alive, it will not only serve as a stern caution, it may also inspire. Credits appear including executive produced by Cherokee Nation, Cherokee CRC LLC, an Aperture Films Limited production. Directed by Joshua Colover. Executive producer, Cheryl Kohenauer. Produced by Joshua Colover, Joseph Erb. Written by Shane Smith. Cherokee artwork by Roy Boney Jr. Art direction by Jimmy French. Director of photography, Christopher Blum. Music composed by Hilary Thomas. Narrated by Marv Allen. Edited by Christopher Blum. Grandfather played by Woodrow Ross. Granddaughter, 10 years old, played by Cheyenne Drowning Bear. Granddaughter, 17 years old, played by Natalie Tomasic. Harpers Ferry Center, National Park Service, Charles Dunkerley, Tim Radford, Bob Cody, Amber Perkins. Trail of Tears, National Historic Trail, National Park Service, Aaron Marr, Superintendent, Sharon Brown, Jerry Krakow, Frank Norris, Andrea Sharon. Cherokee Nation, Chief Chad Smith, Mike Miller, Amanda Clinton. A presentation of the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. Its arrowhead logo features a tall tree, a mountain peak, and a bison.